Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, let me. A second here. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, the Data Driven Methods in Science and Engineering seminar. And today we're glad we're glad to have uh, Professor Eva Kanso with us. And uh, just for a quick introduction, Professor Kanso uh, is the ZH Caprillian uh, uh, Fellow in Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Southern California. Prior to joining USC in 2005, Council held a two-year postdoctorate position in computing and mathematical sciences uh, at Caltech. She received her PhD um, uh, in 2003 and MS degree in 1999 in mechanical engineering, as well as an MA degree in 2002 in mathematics, and all from the University of California at Berkeley. She obtained her Bachelor of Engineering from the American University of Beirut with distinction and held visiting positions at Princeton University, Ecole Polytechnique, the Courant Institute, and the Simons Foundation. At USC, Council founded the Bioinspired Motion Lab that works on fundamental problems in the biophysics of cellular and subcellular processes and the physics of animal behavior, both at the individual and collective levels. A central theme in Council's work uh, is the role of the mechanical uh, environment, specifically the fluid uh, medium and fluid structure interactions in shaping and driving biological functions. Today, Professor Council will tell us about uh, two short stories of fish hydrodynamics. I'm very excited about those stories. Uh, so without further delay, uh, Eva, thank you for being here. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation to be here and to tell you a little bit about some of the thoughts we've been, some of the things we've been thinking in my lab. So my talk is one fish, two fish. And I thought I'd just start by showing you a thousand fish. So this is the interaction of 1000 fish with hydrodynamic interactions and vision-based control laws or rules of how they respond to each other. Um, so before I, I tell you a little bit more about this, I, I think I should first start by telling you about the students who did this work. So the thousand fish is the work of Chen Chen Huang. Uh, the one fish is the work of Hao Chen and the two fish is the work of Tina. And uh, I think I cut my video a little short, but the thousand fish organize into this milling behavior basically at the end. So what we are interested in is behavior and, and behavior, basically locomotion or swimming as an expression of behavior and behavior in all form of lives uh, in all forms of life are basically the, resu is the result of the ability to interact with an environment and to actively interact with that environment. So you have to be able to sense and respond to that environment accordingly. For the fish, the environment is fluid and the interplay between the flow physics and the sensing and motor control modalities are largely unknown. It's not known how the fluid environment has shaped the evolution of the sensory motor control in fish and what sensory cues matter for behavior, for swimming specifically. And, and these questions are difficult to address because they lie at the intersection of physics and neuroscience. And the neuroscience is definitely not the realm of my training, but I am interested in those questions. And what I'm going to tell today are stories on, that are physics-based, but hopefully we can go from there to try to begin to understand something about the evolution of the active sensory motor control in these animals. So in the example of schooling that I just mentioned to you, there are many unknown questions, like what's the role of the hydrodynamics and coordination? How much of this coordination is passive and how much of it is active due to sensory feedback control? Uh, what are, are there any energetic advantages to schooling? What are the sensory cues that matter? So these questions are difficult partly because the physics itself is difficult. And I'm, I'm sure as Steve knows very well, like those computing, computing fluid structure interaction in 
fish is an expensive deal. Here I'm showing two examples of one fish and two fish from Rajat Mittal and Jung-Hyun Seo at uh, Johns Hopkins University, where they showed this beautiful 3D wake of the single fish and the pair that are interacting. And these computations are expensive to scale up. They are expensive as is, and they are expensive to scale up to many interacting uh, fish. So in the example that I started with at the beginning, what I was doing, I was kind of cheating a little bit because I was modeling the fluid interactions by the far field flow that's generated by the individual fish. This a single fish is kind of a, a point singularity that's producing a dipolar flow. And the interaction between those fish was due to these dipolar flows. And even with this simple model of flow interaction, we can get some insights about the collective behavior, such as this new emergent turning mode, this uh, emergent global turning mode, in addition to the swarming, schooling, and milling modes that have been traditionally observed in behavior-based uh, models. And we also see that the fish themselves because they are reacting to the fluid, even though it's a passive reaction to the fluid, their velocity could increase. And that's also in contrast to uh, traditional behavior-based models of collective behavior. And I just want to say very briefly that my student Chen Chen has been generalizing these models to fish in confined geometries. In this case, I'm showing circular confinements and uh, looking at the collective modes that emerge and what's most interesting to me at least is these regions of the parameter space where the uh, school exhibits intermittent bistable behavior where they uh, transition back and forth from milling to spooling, back to milling, back to spooling. And this is all um, for the same parameter values, basically. So getting to my story. On one fish, the story that I, is the first story in my title. So this is a work that's inspired by a study done by, uh, led by uh, Jack Costello of Providence College, where they basically, in this study, 2014, they looked at all animal propulsors, they call them propulsors, or all uh, surfaces that interact with the fluid, whether it's birds or fish or all organisms that interact with the fluid to move. And what they noticed is that there is a universal bending rule that all of these animals, they bend their propulsive surface at about one third from the distal tip. So that's where the bending happens. And that the bending angle is about 30 degrees. So I extracted the data on fish specifically from that study. And as you can see, the flexion angle here, which is the maximum flexion angle I define here as alpha, it's always lying consistently around 30 degrees, independent of the size of the fish that, uh, that they were looking at. And the flexion ratio also, it's about two thirds from the, uh, from the head, basically. And that's surprising. That basically suggests that there is maybe some physical mechanisms, uh, physical selection pressures that kind of drove this conversion design in all animals and specifically in fish. So we are curious about if what's the role of the hydrodynamics as a driving uh, mechanism for this conversion design. But even if we can't be as ambitious, just to understand whether this design having a flapping angle of about 30 degrees at the tail relative to the main body and the flexion point at about two thirds, whether this is beneficial from a hydrodynamic point of view. So to address this question, we did the simplest model possible. So we have the fish is a two length fish. It has one flexion point. Yeah, the anterior is always flapping sinusoidally back and forth. The posterior part, the tail, it could flap together with the anterior into what we would call a rigid flapping. They flap together rigidly, or it could flex or bend relative to the anterior. Now I'm gonna use the words flex and bend in the same meaning, like just, um, just to confuse you, I'm gonna use two words to say the same thing. So um, I looked at active bending first, where the bending is a prescribed. So I have this uh, relative, angle alpha that I just defined, and I'm going to prescribe it to 
follow a Jacobi elliptic uh, wave here shown in red. And I'm going to fix its amplitude to be 30 degrees like the experimental observation. I'm going to fix, to begin, I'm going to fix the flexion point to be at two thirds from the head, one third from the tip. And I'm going to introduce a new parameter that was not discussed in uh, uh, Jack's original paper, uh, which is this phase between the anterior and the posterior. So this phase difference between the two parts of the body. And that turns out to be an important parameter to consider. In the second uh, part, I will look at passive bending because it's not clear whether from, from the image processing that uh, Jack and his team did, it's not clear whether the bending itself is active or passive, but in a model, we can play with those ideas. So in the second uh, part, I allowed the tail to bend passively. So for bending passively, we have to solve for this angle alpha that I have here, and I need an equation of motion for that. And I need to account for the hydrodynamic moments acting on the tail, as well as for the fact that the uh, tip of the, or the connecting point, the flexion point here is moving so that it reduces an additional moment on the tail itself. And I need the fluid model to close the system. And as I said, um, coupled navier stokes simulations with structures are very expensive, so I'm going to choose a much simpler uh, model, which is the vortex sheet model. So what I'm doing here, I'm really solving a two-way coupled problem uh, where the, the motion of the structure affects the vorticity that's being shed in the fluid and the vorticity that's being shed in the fluid uh, feeds back into the motion of, this, of the to link swimmer, but it's it's a, it's a cheaper uh, computation because you only need to keep track of the vorticity that you are shedding in the way. And here I have two problems to solve. The first one is when I have active bending, so I'm prescribing the flapping motion of the anterior part and the bending at the tail or the relative bending between anterior and posterior. And I solve for the swimming motion itself of the fish. And then the second problem, I prescribe only the flapping at the head and I solve for the flexion, the passive flexion and the uh, swimming motion. And here are the examples, the two examples that we begin with. So I have the rigid flapping as a control case, so flapping rigidly back and forth. The active bending, you can decide on the phase in which you want to bend actively. So I'm showing two cases with two different phases. One you're bending in phase and one you're bending anti-phase. And the last one is passive bending. And here it's bending, the, the tail is bending passively or the body is bending passively uh, with zero stiffness. And just to make sure that you're still with me and you're still listening, which swimmer do you think is the fastest? Do I get, do I get anyone? I don't see a chat here. Maybe I, there the should be. Someone one. said passive. The, the last one. I, I would say passive too. Okay, okay, good, good. All right, excellent. You're still alive. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the passive one, that's a good guess. Uh, it's a good guess, but let's see which one is going to be the, the best swimmer. So I first, before I, I tell you, um, let me show you the flow field itself. I mean, the information, all the information is in the vorticity and the sheet, but then you can also construct the velocity field everywhere. And as you can see that those are snapshots of the constructed velocity, you can see that the rigid flapping and the snapshot, it has a leading edge um, circulation, if you like, or vorticity, if you want to be sloppy and call it that. And the active bending, you have a larger, when you're bending in phase, you have a larger leading edge vorticity. You have a stronger circulation in the wave. They are by Kelvin circulation here, and they must be the total circulation in the wake and this big leading edge uh, circulation must be equal. 
Now, if you look at the passive bending, you see that the weight is more linear and more streamlined. And the same you see when you actively bend in an antiphase manner. You have a linear wake, and you also see this big leading edge vortex of separation at the, at the head that breaks down into two counter rotating um, vortices, if you like. So th they must have some effect on, on um, thrust production and, and locomotion. So I'm going to start, actually, I'm going to leave this as a puzzle, just again, to ensure that you're gonna continue with me. I'm going to leave this as a puzzle, whether the passive bending is the best or not. And I'm going to start by comparing the active bending guys to the rigid flap. So here I have the rigid flapping, the active bending in phase and active bending anti-phase. So at the uh, 180, uh, 180 degrees phase. So what you see immediately is that the swimming speed of the rigid upper gets improved when you, when you have the bending motion. It improves a little bit when you actively bend in phase and it improves a lot when you actively bend out of phase. What's surprising to me when I first saw this is that this improvement in swimming speed happens while the average thrust itself is almost the same in all three cases. So the steady state or the average value of its thrust is the same, but the instantaneous way in which the thrust changes over a beating cycle is very different. So in the anti-phase flexion, while you're flapping, you barely generate any negative thrust and the thrust is always close to its average value. You're not producing those big thrust forces and then negative thrust again. So that was in, uh, interesting to see that the instantaneous behavior of the thrust matters a lot. And then we compute the input power to, to produce this movement. And of course, when you're flapping rigidly, you have a level, you need some level of input power to flap rigidly. When you flap um, in phase, you increase that input, your demand on power on average. But when you flap anti phase, your demand of power is almost the same. And then we looked at the circulation and the wake just to see to understand why is the why do we see those different behavior completely? Uh, whether it's that's linked to the flow that is being produced or the wake that's being produced, and you see here the signature of the linear wake is reflected in the circulation and the leading edge circulation that we talked about. And then we did one, one more thing just to emphasize this, this relation of instantaneous um, thrust that we looked at the, at the thrust versus the transverse force. So I'm not showing here the transverse force. I'm only showing the force in the direction of swimming, but we can also compute the transverse force that's acting on the swimmer. And you see that so we're plotting them against each other. This is inspired by people that study gait movement. They usually uh, plot how the, the stride and the x direction versus the up and down motion as you move. Um, oh, yeah, I think you put yourself have... on mute. Oh, OK, there you go. No, right. I'm still here. I'm still okay. here. OK, all right. I'm still here. I'm just. Um, just have a small technical. Perfect. Looks like you're back on the normal. I am back. I'm back. I'm sorry. And I skipped. Uh, just, I was just telling you about this. Uh, plotting the transverse uh, force versus the thrust force. And I was just trying to emphasize the idea that when you have this anti-phase flexion, you actually minimize the negative thrust and you spend most of your time in this um, positive thrust. This is over one cycle of oscillation. The other thing that's important to note is that the magnitude of your transverse forces are much smaller when you're doing this anti-phase active flexion. So, I know I, I mentioned a lot how it's important to look at the instantaneous force generation, but then I'm going to, to look at performance metrics that are all period average. So I'm going to 
take the period average speed, the period average power, and I'm going to define a period average efficiency. And I'm going to scale all these quantities by the control case, which is the case where the uh, flapping is rigid. So from now on, anytime I talk about speed, I really mean scaled speed by the control case or scaled efficiency by the control case. And I'm going to look at how these quantities vary when we change this flexion phase phi between anterior and posterior. And what you see here is that as you change the phase itself, As you change the phase itself, um, you see that um, the you get lots of benefit in terms of speed relative to the rigid flapping and in terms of efficiency as you get closer to anti-phase flexion. And also in terms of scaled power, the input power decreases and it becomes even less than what you need to rigidly flap. This is value one becomes less than what you need to rigidly flap at higher flexion um, phase. So what this says is that it's not only enough to look at the flexion or the tail flapping amplitude and the flexion ratio, you should also look at the flexion phase, that this phase matters a lot for hydrodynamic benefits. And you can actually produce hydrodynamic benefits by actively actively flapping or actively bending rather than passive. I mean, I haven't told you what's the story of the passive bending, but I'm telling you that you can produce hydrodynamic benefit by actively bending. Um, so then of course, you're all waiting to know what happens with the passively bending body. Does it lead to improved swimming performance? And here, what we did, we looked at the case where we have um, spring between the anterior and posterior, so some elasticity, some stiffness. And we looked at the case of varying the stiffness and letting the tail respond passively to the flow. And what you could see is that when you have zero stiffness, the bending of the tail is also anti-phase relative to the prescribed flapping of the head. As you increase the stiffness, you start to shift the space difference. And of course, for very high stiffness, the system becomes completely rigid, like a rigid flapper. You should approach the case of a rigid flapper and the head and tail uh, flap in phase. Now, the question is, where do you get the hydrodynamic advantage? So we first, what we first did is we quantified the amplitude of this passive uh, bending, passive flapping and also the phase between anterior to posterior. And you see that the phase goes from nearly anti-phase at very small stiffness to nearly in-phase at high stiffness, as I just mentioned, not surprising. There is an um, optimal stiffness for the flexion amplitude. But what's interesting is when you look at the scaled speed and the scaled efficiency, one is the rigid flapper and you see no enhancement in speed by having the tail bending passively, but you do see enhancement in speed by having the uh, enhancement in efficiency by having the tail bending passively. So passive bending leads to improvement in swimming efficiency. Passive bending of the tail leads to improvement in swimming efficiency, but it does not help at all in speed. But what's more interesting here is that um, you know, elastic restoring forces do not help. When you have a stiffness that's moderate stiffness, it doesn't help. Your benefit, you get most of the benefit when the stiffness is nearly zero. So what that means is that you need to be, you need to have the compliance of the body, you need to be as close to complete compliance as possible no restoring force, no resistance, no elastic resistance to hydrodynamic forces is most uh, uh, beneficial for efficiency. So now we get to this point where we understand that if we have passive bending at zero stiffness, we can get improved efficiency. If we have active bending at antiphase, we get improved speed and efficiency. 
And what we also noticed is that the passive bending at zero stiffness happens at antiphase. It just, it's an emergent property that it bends antiphase. Here we are prescribing, we're actively causing it to bend antiphase. So we were wondering whether there is a relationship between these two and specifically whether um, the swimmer could have learned from passive bending to improve its performance by bending actively in accord with the hydrodynamic forces that are generated naturally during passive bending. And that, um, to, to try to address this type of question, we looked at the passive bending case and we said, okay, let's say you have this flow produced when you bend passively. Let's say you had a virtual active tail that's attached, then that's virtual. It's really not interfering with the flow field in any sense. And this active tail, it has to bend actively. So it would have a prescribed velocity or relative velocity relative to the head. And let's introduce this bending agreement parameter, which says how much in agreement this uh, velocity of the tail is with the passive flow that is um, that with the passive flow field. And if this a uh, bending agreement parameter is positive, it means that the tail, when it's bending, it's utilizing the flow. If it's negative, it means it's fighting against the flow. And it turns out that, uh, just to remind you, when you're actively bending, you get most advantage when you're almost bending antiphase, near antiphase. So now when we computed this um, uh, bending agreement parameter with passive flow, this is what we get. We see that the flexion agreement parameter is negative. So you're fighting against the flow when you're bending actively in phase and it's positive or you're bending with the flow when you're bending anti-phase. So actively bending in concert with passive hydrodynamics helps. And we saw that it's, there is a clear correlation between when the this flexion agreement parameter or bending agreement parameter is positive and the improvement in speed and efficiency that we see in the, in, in the uh, active flapping. So, so, so basically, I'm just repeating my message here is that actively bending in agreement with the local flow is helpful. And, to come back to the original question that I started from, which is what about this flexion angle and flexion ratio? We said that most, uh, at least from the data set that we started from, most fish have converged to uh, having this bending occur at two thirds from the head and at about 30 degrees angle. So because our model, our fluid structure interaction model is not extremely expensive. Uh, we can do a parametric sweep over all possible angles and flexion ratio. And we can do that for different flexion phase, which is this new parameter that I'm introducing you to. And we see that if you are doing in-phase flexion, uh, you, and again, I'm reporting here the speed in the top row and the efficiency in the bottom row. And you see that the scaled speed is always scaled with the rigid flapper. The scaled speed, you get some little advantage in terms of scaled speed, like 10, 20% increase in speed when you're actively uh, flapping in phase, but no advantage in terms of efficiency. But when you actively flap anti-phase, you get about 250 percent increase in speed relative to rigid flapping and about 700 or seven times uh, increase in efficiency relative to, to rigid flapping. So those are very large, those are very large advantages, hydrodynamic benefits if you actively flap in concert with a passive uh, hydrodynamics and they occur in the region of the parameter space of the flexion angle around here, they occur for flexion angles that are kind of consistent with the experimental data and flexion ratios, especially for the efficiency around two thirds uh, from, the, from the head of the swimmer. And what 
I just the last thing we did is that we superimposed. So we took the region from our parametric study where we see enhanced speed, two times enhanced speed, and we took the region where we see, uh, I think, also two times enhanced efficiency. And we superimposed on that the data from uh, Jack Costello's uh, paper. And you see that the data kind of lives in a very nice its place in this parameter space between enhanced speed and enhanced efficiency. And many of those fish that are in this list are migratory fish. So tuna, for example, are supposed to, uh, are migratory and they traverse long distances and they live in the very nice spots between enhanced speed and enhanced efficiency. So just to conclude this, this particular study, just to say that we see hydrodynamic benefits when the tail actively flaps in concert with passive flows that are produced by the anterior part of the body. This passive bending is critical, in my opinion. Now, this is the part where it becomes a little bit of an interpretation part. I think this passive bending is critical because it offers a direct route by which this pattern of bending could have evolved in many different animal lineages. The idea is that when you have a a flexible or compliant tail, it confers some advantages to you. And then when you actuate and concert with that passive process, you get greater advantage. So this could be kind of a, an evolutionary route towards this conversion design, because in evolutionary processes, you usually have an advanced state that stems from simpler intermediate states. And material compli compliance can be viewed as a starting point in this evolutionary process that, um, that led to this conversion design that was pointed out in, in Jack's paper. So this is my story for the single fish. And I want to uh, move on to the two fish problem. Let's see. I have a few minutes to tell you about the two fish problem. And I think, uh, yeah, let's, let's jump into the two fish problem immediately. So in this, uh, this is an, a slightly different story where uh, we have two fish interacting. And the idea is that in these, this, this is one study from the group of Ian Cousin, where they looked at the interaction of a pair of goldfish and they saw something, they, they kept track of the phase between the, or the phase difference between their tail beat. And they kept track of the phase difference and also of the distance between the two fish. And they noticed something is that this phase difference is always linear in the distance itself. And the idea here that they are proposing is, is an interesting idea, which is that this follower fish is always matching its phase, its tail beat phase, not to the tail beat of the leader, but actually to the local flow that's being produced by the tail of the leader. So you match the tail beat to the local flow itself. So kind of see the theme here with the study I just told you about the single fish. So the idea is that this phase difference is linear in, in in distance because you're matching the, the flow that's produced by the leader. But this, this is proposed as a strategy for schooling, that this is, could, could be a strategy for hydrodynamic benefits in schooling. But this idea here, this is a small movie from Ian's paper on the interaction of the two swimmers. But what's most intriguing about, sorry, what's most intriguing about these uh, results is that they occur even when the fish have no, even when they knock off vision and flow sensing in the fish. So no visual cues, no sensory cues about where the other fish is. You still get the same relation between phase and distance. So this kind of suggests that maybe this is a passive mechanism. This is not an active strategy, or maybe it is an active strategy that is reinforcing a passive mechanism that's already in the flow. And we know that um, passive hydrofoils that are have no sensory feedback control at all, they also are able to 
uh, reach stable formations at constant distances from each other. This is the work of uh, Leif Reistroff and Jun Zhang and Mike Shelley from the Plant Institute, where they have this beautiful experiment of two heaving, of two heaving um, hydrofoils in a tank. They are actuated separately, independently. And you see that they reach those um, immersion formations, as they call them, or uh, pairwise formations, completely passively through hydrodynamic interactions. And in one of the papers, and one of the recent papers that they had, they reported on this relation between the phase difference, the phase of the flapping, and the distance between the leader and the follower. And indeed, they actually showed, this is data from their paper, they showed that this distance depends linearly on phase, because it, in their case, they are describing phase and computing distance, and not computing, and they, the distance is an immersion property, and they, it's easier to describe the phase itself. So we were basically, we were interested to know whether those are two different phenomena, two different fluid mechanisms, or they are the same. What they, the fish experiments that Ian Cousin uh, reported and this phenomenon here and the engineered or, or physical structures that are interacting via, hydrodyna via hydrodynamics only. So, um, so we do have evidence to think that flow mediated coordination could emerge in pairs of swimmers with no sensory feedback control. And we did, we used our model of um, vortex sheet model to try to address this problem. So here I'm going to show two swimmers that are in line, kind of like the Courant Institute study, but instead of heaving, they are pitching. And the are pitching at um, zero phase difference. And in the second case, I'm going to show that they are flapping at a phase difference. They are starting from this particular location and let's look at their behavior. So you see that the follower is going to passively move and decide to sit at a specific location in the wake of the leader. And this is a passive mechanism, no sensory feedback control here. So basically, the, in the case where you had zero phase difference, it decided on a distance. In the case where you had some phase shift, it decided on another distance. And what's interesting is that these distances, these are equilibria that are not the only equilibria. Actually, there are multiple. There is a series of equilibria depending on where you start the follower relative to the leader. There are a series of these equilibria. And this, ha this has been noted in the work of the Grant Institute and the experimental work of the, of the Grant Institute people. But what Sina did here is that he looked at, um, he basically looked at he swept over the phase lag and he looked at those um, equilibrium distances and he saw exactly this linear relationship that was reported in Ian Cousin and in the experiments. And because it is a model where you can actually compute the power saving or the power that is produced by the or needed by the follower in comparison to swimming alone. So this is the ratio, P is the power needed to swim in formation versus P naught is the power needed to swim alone. And you see that um, you need definitely less power. It's all in the blue region, in the blue color. So you need less power to swim in formation. So this formation is stable, it's passively stable, and it takes less power to so it's kind of for free. you get the power reduction for free. Uh, the flow would like you to be in this position, and this position would lead to a power reduction. And we compared then Sina compared um, the results from the experiments from the heaving foil and from the fish experiments, and you see that they follow nicely a similar trend. And the last thing that Sina did is he looked at if you were to tether the two swimmers at fixed distance, because the only, when you have free swimming, the only uh, positions or relative positions that are accessible are the emergent ones. But when you tether the swimmers, 
you can force them to be at a different relative position. And you see that when you force them to be at a different relative position, they don't have this energy benefit or this power benefit. So this idea of uh, immersion formation at distances that are passively, uh, these passive immersion formations at distances that are consistent with this vortex phase matching idea and lead to power saving is quite powerful, I think. And uh, the second, the last thing I want to show you is this idea of now we had the swimmers are were in line. I want to show you the case where we have an offset in the lateral distance between the swimmers. They are starting together. And let's see what happens in that case. In that case as well, you see the follower decides to reach um, completely passively, reach a place behind the leader and, and settle there and swim together in stable formation. So again, we see this conversions to an equilibrium position. And um, just to emphasize this idea that those equilibria are not, are not um, unique in the flow of the leader. What Sina did here, he has the leader fish, he's changing the phase itself of the follower and he's changing the lateral distance of where the follower is. So for every lateral distance, he is sweeping over different phase, uh, different phases. And he looks at where the equilibrium position is. And you see that you have a whole family of these equilibria. So it doesn't matter for the follower fish. It can decide to flap at any phase, at any lateral distance from the leader. It is going to settle in one of these equilibrium points. And then he took this equilibria and he computed the power savings at these equilibria. And in almost all of these equilibria, you get some amount of power savings. The power reduction, of course, decreases as you move laterally far away from the leader. But as long as you are close to the leader, you have big power savings up to 30, 35% power savings to swim in the wake of the leader. And then the last thing that he did, which I'm, I'm not going to say much details about it's uh, looking at the stability of these equilibria. I'm telling you these are equilibria, you can perturb about them and you can see how far or how long it takes you to come back to the equilibrium. And you can look at this, their stability. And he did that, you know, uh, computed, uh, quantified the stability in terms of these restoring forces, restoring hydrodynamic forces. And these equilibria are very stable. So basically what we learned from here is that this vortex phase matching idea is, uh, is not affected by the lateral offset from the leader. It's driven by the same mechanism, whether you're in line or at lateral offset. And that power saving and cohesion does not vary much for small lateral distances, but they do decrease here when you move further uh, out away from the leader. So, Last thing that we wanted to look at uh, is to try to understand what is the hydrodynamic mechanism that's leading to this flow-mediated uh, coordination or it. And to, to do that, we did a similar thing that we looked at in the first problem where we looked at the wake of a single leader, a single fish. We looked at its wake and we're asking whether there is information already in that wake that, um, that tells about where a follower should sit and what are the energy savings by sitting in that location. So this is the flow created by a single swimmer. We did the same a trick of having a virtual follower. It's clapping at a velocity V. It can be at any location now. So it can be at any location in the wake, in this wake. And we can compute a flow agreement parameter, which is the amount of basically the agreement between the flapping of the follower, between its flapping velocity V and the flow in the wake of the leader. And if this flow agreement parameter is negative, the flow is detrimental to the follower motion. If it's positive, the flow is beneficial to the follower motion. And we can compute that as a whole flow agreement parameter field in the wake of the leader. 
So you see that there are spots in the wake of the leader or in the wake of the single fish. There are spots where the flow agreement parameter is negative. So those would be detrimental uh, for a follower. And there are spots where they are positive. This flow agreement parameter is positive. And what's interesting is that as you vary this phase of flapping, this flow, those, those blobs of positive and negative flow agreement parameter, they just switch, they move downstream, if you like. So I'm going to make three propositions, and these are my last propositions here, that actual follower, this is, this is for the virtual follower, but I'm going to claim that if you have an actual follower, that it will passively converge to relative positions where the flow agreement parameter is maximum. And that the energy saving correlates with this flow agreement parameter. So the more you agree with the passive flow of the leader, the more energy saving you get. And that the stability of the formation can also be predicted from this reduced order model. And these claims are based on based on comparing the two pair interaction results that I just showed you to results from the wake of the single uh, swimmer. So if we take this line here, this is based on two uh, way interaction between a leader and the follower. And if I now look at my flow agreement parameter, which is the maxima of this flow agreement parameter, which is computed only based on a single only based on the single swimmer, you see perfect agreement. So when you look at the wake of the single swimmer, you can predict already where should the follower sit. And indeed, that's where you, what you see when you do the two-way coupling between the leader and the follower. And the same with the um, predicting the power reduction. You cannot predict exactly the amount of power reduction, but you see a correlation between where the agreement parameter is large versus uh, 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 where the energy savings are large. So there is a direct correlation. And you don't know exactly how much energy saving you get, but you know that you will get some energy saving when the flow agreement parameter is positive. And the last thing is that you can do uh, from this reduced order model, you can also predict the stability of the formation itself. And I think I, I just want to conclude by saying that this hydrodynamic information about pairwise formation, power saving, and cohesion, and cohesion are all we are all present in the wake of the single swimmer. So put it, let's put everything together. So we have one fish. We have hydrodynamic benefits when the tail actively flaps in concert with the flow produced by the anterior part of the fish. In the two fish case, we get hydrodynamic benefits when the flow interactions stabilize. We get hydrodynamic benefits and we actually get a little bit more than hydrodynamic benefits in terms of energy. We get that the flow interaction stabilize active flapping and actively flapping follower in relative positions that synchronize uh, with the passive flow of the leader. So basically, what we're what we're seeing kind of is that the this in, in in the one fish, the flow interaction with the material compliance are critical to because they offer a route by which you can actively flap to improve benefits. And in the two fish case, we also see that the passive flow interactions are also critical because they also. Uh, uh, offer a route towards which you, you fish could have evolved to actively tune their relative positions in the school. So I'm going to basically point you to the work of Hao Tian and Sina on the archive and uh, and stop here. I just want to say one last thing from inspired by Bruce Lee, which is this idea that you be water. So that seems to be the most beneficial for hydrodynamic benefits is when you when you actively actuate in concert with the passive hydrodynamics. And I want to thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.
All right, and um, thank you very much. It was a great talk. And um, so we'll open the floor for questions. Um, uh, you can post on chat or raise your hand or just ask. I, I have a question um, and I'm sorry if there's a fire truck in the background on my side. Um, no, so I, I know there's a lot of researchers who would love to kind of play around with this kind of data and try things out. Like this is such a compelling system, uh, you know, for synchronization, for the fluid dynamics. Um, and I've like done a little Googling, but do you know of any good resources out there, like open resources to get started on this kind of stuff? Um, open resources for what? For the vortex sheet method? For, for which one? Yeah, I guess either for the computational methods or just data sets for like, like the big movie you showed with a thousand fish, you know, or is there data like that out there? So I'm happy to share this data. This is data from my lab, a thousand fish, and I'm happy to share that, no problem. We have, we don't have the, the model itself is published in PRL. And we have another publication that's coming up with a confinement, but the code itself is not available on GitHub and maybe we should make it available. That's a good point. Okay, and just fantastic work. Such uh, a nice arc of work, really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Okay, guys. Uh, I got a question. So uh, what one of the fascinating phenomena you see in schooling fish is these sharks that will <laughs> get these fish to swim in basically they'll trap them into a vortex and then they'll just basically eat the whole thing if you were to put something like a uh you know you have your blue fish now you put a red fish <laughs> let's say that the red fish is a predator do you think i mean i'm just wondering your model seems like you could actually do this where you say like if i'm going to try to do an avoidance then you could imagine could the red fish trajectory be planned so yeah. that that red fish just maybe yeah. you would need a couple of them because it seems like these sharks can to do this like there's a few of them in concert and they can just basically bring an entire school of fish into a circle and then then just I am that going would be, to, I, have you thought about doing something like that yeah. i'm going to show you a movie by um by chen chen i don't know if chen chen is listening um, let me see I, it always takes me a long time to find my movies, but this is this is or all my files. So this is very consistent with what. Just one second. I'm going to show you a predator coming over. <laughs> that's because that's a fascinating control problem, right? A fascinating control problem. Yeah. yeah. Where is Chen Chen's movie? Okay, here we go. Just while you're looking for the video, I also noticed that uh, in your efficiency zones and your speed zones, like, you know, the predators were a little more in the speed zone and some of the, the moseying fish were in your efficiency zone. I thought that was really fascinating. Thank you. Okay, can you see? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so the color of the fish is their velocity. And it's a very simple predator, but they are doing what they are supposed to do. They evade it when it comes close and then they come back together when it leaves. So, so the predator motion is prescribed. It's not part of the dynamics, but the fish motion is completely um, immersion. 
Now, Nathan, you want the predator to stay in the middle and you want them to <laughs> I, I, want the, I want the predator to live. So he's going to have to do something else. <laughs> but if you had a couple, it's almost like you'd shepherd them, right? I, this would right. be really interesting to watch them, see if they could shepherd it and like keep them constrained, even though they want to split. If you could, right? I, I, you know, that would be fascinating because you actually see it in nature, right? To them to do that. But Right. That seems like it'd be a hard problem. And it'd be interesting to see, could you figure out the control algorithms that these predators have figured out to like basically be shepherding this? And then unlike the shepherds who take care of the flock, this is all about <laughs> right. eat them all. <laughs> right, right. So. I think that, that would be fascinating to have multiple predators that are cooperating together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, Ava. I really like the talk, um, but so I, have a, I have a question and it's inspired by, I mean, you probably know where this is coming from. Um, if you have something that's undulating, so it's in 3D, is there, <laughs> some, is there some benefit to, um, I mean, maybe it's got you know, many different wiggles to it. So uh, let, let's just say two, can you get some benefit if they're moving at the proper phase like you're showing because you're showing something that's that's 2d i'm wondering how this would work in 3d for some kind of undulating beast yes i i don't have the answer to this i i, I know that for fish it's easier because even the flow is three-dimensional their movement is mostly two-dimensional i mean yes there is some uh, stabilization of, of the role in 3d but they its movement is mainly or it's predominant motion in 2D. For the snake, I, I would imagine that yes, even more so because it's passive, even more so because it doesn't have a propulsive surface. The flight itself is passive, right? But for the snake that's flying down from a tree, its whole gliding motion is, it's all about stabilization and control of how you stabilize it. So I am assuming that the coordination between the different sections of the body would be even more crucial because it cannot just flap and produce a lot of thrust or a lot of lift. Or... Yeah. But I, I mean, and it's not just snakes in the air. It could be snakes in the water or eels or right. other things. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So Shane, we can use a completely deformable body for, for that type of study. The issue is always in the hydrodynamics. We still need to do 2D hydrodynamics in if we are gonna use those simplified order, reduced order models. The trade-off is between, you wanna reduce order model for the hydrodynamics, it's mostly two-dimensional because we don't know how to do non-axisymmetric three-dimensional flows with those reduced order models. But maybe maybe Steve has some ideas of how to get us to that direction because that, that's always the issue. I love it when someone says that there's a problem they don't know how to reduce order model. <laughs> I knew you were the right guy to tell to talk to about this. Yeah. How can we do 3D hydrodynamics in a reduced order fashion? Okay. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? So the, the movies uh, you showed from Rajat Natal's group, I've seen the similar ones from Petrus Kumitsakis's group. Of course. Okay. And then, you know, it's super impressive stuff, but it's so expensive to derive these control laws. Like it's a feat of modern engineering, really. Right, right. And you can at most do that with two or the, the, the driving uh, force here is to try to come with some interpretable strategy of how should you behave if you know exactly what the local flow looks like. You don't even need to know what the other guys are doing. Just what the local flow at your location looks like. How can you come up with a strategy that's easy from a sensory perspective? You only need to have some proprioception of what's acting on you and that's interpretable. You know what it is. You can go directly from sensory measurement to control action. That's, that's the challenge. 
Um, I have a question, um, just a general question about uh, if you, if it's possible to, or if that work has been done before, if you can just take a movie somehow of uh, School of Fish and from that sort of deduce uh, the flow field and, you know, understand basically based on a movie. I know that would be kind of hard, but has it been done before or is it, do you think it's possible? Yes, excellent question. So there is a lot of recent work to do kinematics. So you have, we're, we're working with Guillaume Ryoko from Luncom, who has basically an underwater imaging sonar system. It's, it's fascinating what he can do because this is independent of light conditions, independent of flow conditions. You can go with the sonar imaging, you can image the actual fish school in situ, and you can do reconstruction of where the individual fish are, right? You can, but constructing flow itself, you have to make, that, that's more complicated. Now in lab experiments, you could do both in laboratory experiments. You could supposedly, theoretically, you could track the kinematics of the fish and you could do PIV on the flow itself in a, in a lab experiment. I don't know anyone who has done both. I know people that do either one or the other. I, I know PIV around a single fish. Um, I don't know PIV around the school of fish yet, but we are also working with Matt McHenry at UC Irvine who just acquired a 3D tomographic PIV system. And hopefully that will produce beautiful data once, once he gets it going. Nice, thanks. Thank you. Um, so just the um, chat uh, has a response for a request for a data set. Yes. So there's a, uh, suggesting there's a conference for uh, these issues, visual observation and analysis of vertebrate and insect behavior workshop. Um, okay, so a uh, question from Michael. Uh, has, work, has this work been applied to horizontal tails such as whales in addition uh, to the vertical tails of fish? No, not really. I mean, the question is always the same. If you have a finite span, you you probably will have to worry about 3D effects at the edge of the whale, um, but at the edge of the fluke. But if you're only interested in taking cross-section through the middle, vertical cross-section through the middle of the fluke, then those types of models can be applied as well. And I don't see any, any difference of why it should be different. Maybe you need to worry a little bit about buoyancy or gravity. Okay, uh, thank you, Eva, for this uh, amazing talk. Um, really enjoyed it. And so with this, um, we concluded the seminar for this year. Uh, hopefully we'll start again next fall. So uh, thank you everyone uh, for coming and thank you uh, Eva again for coming and, and and um, hope to see you again uh, in person. I look forward to that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Good to see you, Shane. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Take care, everyone.